Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Greg Kalzer. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, it's good to see everyone here, uh, especially it looks like the, the survival of the fittest here this morning. Uh, we've got so many people that are sick today and home, so if you're joining us from home, we're so glad that you're listening in, uh, and we pray for your quick recovery, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, we have a number of people in our congregation who uh, are in tough spots physically uh, that we want to pray for. Adam's father, D. Adam Mays' father. Um, Donna Hauser uh, is struggling. And also we have Leslie um, and Tony. And Leslie is in Sycamore Hospital. So we've got a, we've got a few people who are in hard places. And as the people of God, we want to uh, pray for them and be involved in their lives. Uh, Ron and I are in the midst of, of a couple situations that are going on with uh, her workplace. So some people that we're really concerned about that uh, are at death's door. And so we'd appreciate wisdom and prayer for us as we love uh, in these places. Uh, and I want to encourage you <clears throat> to enter into these moments and pray uh, for the individuals who are in there. And I just want to begin uh, by praying for them today before we get underway. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful, uh, Lord, today that you are the one who's conquered sin in the grave. And Lord, apart from that, uh, we would face a time uh, in the culture in which we're in, let alone the personal struggles that we have. Uh, Lord, it's, it would seem hopeless and despairing. It'd only be a place for rage and anger, uh, Lord, for lashing out, uh, for desperation. But Lord, you're the one who has freed us from everything that truly threatens us, Lord. And no matter what we face day in and day out, Lord, you have guaranteed and you're faithful and you're powerful and you've demonstrated it, the depth of your love in the cross and the depth of your power in the empty tomb. That Lord, today we may not face the day with despair or anger. We do not face the day without hope. Lord, we have hope because of you. And Lord, we have hope not only ultimately for the end of all things, but today to follow you and hold fast to you as we walk through these days. And so, Lord, I pray for Leslie today. I pray for your mercy in her life. I pray that you would draw her and encourage her. I pray for her blessing. Lord, we just pray that, uh, Lord, that you would just draw her back to us, Lord, if it be your will. Lord, I pray, uh, Lord, that you would just, uh, uh, that she would know your goodness and grace and testify to it in the midst of her weakness. I pray for Dee today. Uh, Lord, please, would you touch him? I pray for his wife that you would encourage and comfort her. Lord, I pray for Adam and his brothers. They stand alongside. Lord, help them to lean in on you, trust you. Help them to testify to your power in the midst of a situation that doesn't make sense for people to have hope and for courage and to love one another generously. Uh, Lord, I pray for us as a congregation. Lord, help us, Lord, to walk well with each other. Lord, help us to be faithful. Lord, as Samuel said, Lord, help us not to sin against our brothers and sisters by not joining them in their difficult moments. Lord, we want to pray for them. We ask for your attention, your blessing. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, well, <clears throat> today we begin a new series in the book of James. And uh, you noticed, I hope, as you walked in that the kind of subtitle for our series is called Hold Fast. And you'll see this uh, show up. And the reason why uh, 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 this comes from a kind of a nautical background, the idea of hold fast uh, that when you had a, a sailor uh, or a captain that was sailing through the storm uh, and the sea got uh, crazy and wild, uh, he would tell his sailors to hold fast. And what they would do is they would go to something that was immovable, something that they could hold on to that would weather the storm. So they would go to something that was strong, something that was sure, something that uh, would not move, not something, some cargo or something like that, but they would go to the main mask or they would go to an important part of the thing. And here, the analogy that we're using here as we come to the book of James, as we go through the difficulties of life, where, what are you going to hold on to? to give you direction and safety and guidance and blessing as we go through the difficulties of life. And where we are in this moment in our culture, uh, whether you're looking at the cultural picture or whether you're looking at uh, your own personal life and the difficulties that you're in, every one of us can identify with the need to find solid ground in the face of what seems like chaos in terms of that. So that's what we're talking about here. And James is going to take us. We're going to introduce the book of James here in just a moment. Now, this little booklet, I hope you saw it right there underneath the sign as you came in. I want to encourage everyone, 
Uh, if you're a member here, you should definitely have one of these. If you're a regular attender here, please take those. Uh, if you're visiting with us, uh, we'd love to have you for the series and to help you to participate in this series is this little booklet. Uh, and this booklet is, is, is as we did with the book of Ephesians last fall, uh, to help you study in preparation for the sermon as you come. So you're coming uh, kind of as an active participant. You're not coming in hearing about the passage for the first time. You're reading through, talking through. And this is a great thing for you to do in a family, great thing as a couple for you to do with each other, uh, a great thing for you to do with a group of friends to meet together and talk about. And you'll notice that the kind of rhythm of what you do uh, is it's kind of laid out in here, uh, a procedure, and you want to read through here. But you'll notice you're just going to spend some time looking at the passage and reading it, and it's laid out for you. And then you're going to try to summarize what the passage is about. And then you're going to say, well, so what? Well, if this passage is true, uh, and if this is what it says about God or about myself or about the way in the world, then what does that mean for me? What should I do? And then we have a verse that we're going to be memorizing. You'll see that verse here a little bit later uh, together that we're going to memorize. It gets at one of the key thoughts. As a matter of fact, the first verse that we're memorizing, I would argue, is the key verse in the whole book. It's the theological wager. It's the claim that James makes that makes sense of everything else he's going to say, right? Uh, and this is uh, also the claim about God that is one of the first ones that we're tempted to doubt when we go through dark times. So James 1.17 is our first one. Then you'll notice it culminates with sharing, right? So the goal, the goal of biblical study is never just knowledge. It's knowledge that should shape the way you think, the way you act, the way you feel, it should transform you, but it's ultimately meant to go through you to somebody else. So you know that, that you're, you're engaging in the Word of God in the way that God wants you to when it's not only changing you, but it's going through you to other people. Now, if it's changing you, it's going to go through to other people, right? Even if you don't say anything, if your attitudes change, if the way you deal with difficulties changes, if the way you talk changes, it's going to affect people around you, even if you don't say it out loud. So this is what we're doing here in this kind of a rhythm. Uh, we're going to start with the very next passage. So I'm going to deal with chapter 1, verses 1 through 11 today. And then when you come in next Sunday, you'll have studied, I believe it's verses 12 through 17 of the chapter, 12 through 18, something like that, that you'll have studied that for the next week, and then we'll move through as we do that. All right, so hold fast, and that's our series. Now today, I think, I'm trying to move forward here, right? Today, we want to talk about 1, 2 through 11. And here, this is the initial statement that James wants to make that undergirds everything he's going to say in every one of the other sections. And he's going to say, I want you to hold fast in the midst of difficulties with joy. Okay? There's a lot of ways you can hold fast, and there's a lot of ways you can bail out, but hold fast with joy. God is up to something deeply good. Right? Deeply good. And this is, this is the important thing. That little uh, uh, modifier there, deeply good, is God is up to something really profound, really deep in your life and the lives of the people around you. Uh, and it's often not what we expect. It's often what, not what we're looking for, not looking for. It's often something that is beyond the timetable that we think it needs to happen in. Right? So God is up to something deeply good. And so uh, James altogether, the key to navigating life's challenges without going over to the dark side, and we'll talk about that, is to hold fast to the truth of God's goodness and his sufficiency, to his goodness and his sufficiency, right? Holding on to that. So if God is good, number one, He's the one that we need to turn to and trust in the moments of difficulty. And if he's sufficient, he's the resource that we need to consult first, right, as we go through difficulties. So that's our, our overlook at the book of James. Now, let's introduce a little bit about the author and about the setting of the book. Now, this is something that I would encourage you, if you're studying any book in the Bible, to begin with an overview, and you'll find some guidance there in that little uh, booklet but to read the book a number of times all the way through. And I would encourage you to do that this week, even though you're going to be studying that little section in chapter 1, I would encourage you to take a couple days and just read through James 1 through 5 in one setting. Just read through it all. And try, as you're reading, take out maybe a, uh, a, a highlighter or a pencil. And if you don't like to mark in your own Bible, which I think you should, I think you should wear Bibles out 
after a while. Bibles are not meant to be beautiful things that you keep on shelves and you admire from a distance. They're meant to be used. And so get a Bible, and if you say, well, I got a nice leather Bible, and I don't want to do that, and that was given to me by my grandmother, or whatever the case may be, all right, well, then go to the web, go to BibleGateway.com, and go there and print out the book of James from BibleGateway.com, right? Print it out, and then you can do everything that you want to to the book of James as you're working your way through, and know at the end of the day, you're not messing up that that special Bible that you want to have, right? So you go and you mark it up. Every time you see a word repeated, underline it, right? Every time you see a thought repeated, you underline it. And look for the ideas that James keeps talking about over and over and over again, right? So mark it up and get a sense of the whole so that you can dig in. Well, as we read it, the first thing we come up with in chapter 1 is James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there's a lot of Jameses, Jacobas. There's a lot of Jacobases in the New Testament. So which one is he? And what we know about him is that he's not the James of the James and John sons of Zebedee, James and John. And the reason why we know that is because that James is dead before this book is written. If you remember him, Herod Agrippa, uh, right? Uh, mar- he died as a martyr. Uh, in terms of that. So it's not that James, and we have every reason to believe that it's James, the Lord's brother, the half-brother of Jesus, right? He's probably the oldest brother of Jesus because we find him listed in Matthew 13, in the, first in order, uh, which usually uh, in the Greco-Roman world means that he's the oldest of the ones mentioned. He was initially opposed to Christ. If you read John 7, and I would encourage you to do that, uh, he was so... Um, He so hated his brother Jesus that he tried to get him killed. They knew knew that people were trying to kill Jesus, and so they tried to encourage him to go up to the festival in Jerusalem and make himself known because they they thought he was full of it and was a self-promoter, and they wanted him to go up there and make himself known so that he could be captured and killed, right? Uh, A really a warm uh, home environment for Jesus, if you will, Uh, And he saw the resurrected Christ. We don't know when James came to Christ, but we know in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus appeared to him as the resurrected Messiah. That's probably a good candidate for his conversion, uh, if not before. And then we find him as someone prominent in the early church. Paul refers to him as one of the pillars of the early church. And he shows up in Acts chapter 15 at what's often referred to as the first church council, where they decide issues with regards to Jews and Gentiles. What do Gentiles have to do to be a part of the church? So he's a very, very important person. But what I want you to notice here is notice how he identifies himself as servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So he doesn't come based on some sort of biological relationship to Jesus. He comes as someone who's submitted to him as Savior and Lord. And so he comes as a servant to speak to. And who does he speak to here? He's coming to speak to, I'm having a hard time moving forward. He comes to speak to Jewish believers, okay? Now, this, as we look at the way they're referred to, notice in verse 1, he refers to them as uh, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered. There's really only two ways you could take this. You could take it as an actual reference to people who belong to the children of Israel, right? The 12 tribes represent the different tribes that make up the children of Israel, ethnically. Or you could view it as a kind of a spiritual uh, kind of metaphor for people who belong to uh, the people of faith, right? The true Israel. Well, here, as we read through, I think it's the first. It's referring to people who are actually ethnic Jews, but it's very clear that they're more than just Jews, they're believers in Messiah Jesus. Everywhere um, James refers to them, he refers to them as brothers and sisters. As a matter of fact, I, wanna, I want you to see this. Um, James loves that family metaphor. And so when we think about our relationship in here, it's not just that we're friends, It's not just that we're acquaintances. It's not just that we're members at Emmanuel Baptist Church. If we believe in Jesus, we actually belong to the same family. And I have responsibilities to you like a family member. And so notice how he uh, addresses them. And look in verse 2, chapter 1, verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Now, some translations will just read brothers. Well, in, in the Greek language, If I wanted to refer to everybody, males and females, 
I would use what a masculine plural, right? We used to do that in English, now it's considered sexist, right? We used to call mankind, now we use humankind, right? Well, in the Greek world, if you wanted to say brothers and sisters, you just said adelphoi, which stands for brothers and sisters, for everyone who's related to me by family. This is why in the NIV, in many translations, they put brothers and sisters where you find others saying brothers. And they're just interpreting because James is not referring to the men of his congregation. He's referring to everyone in his congregation. And you find that all the way through. Sometimes he'll step back uh, and look at verse 19 and he say, my dear, my beloved brothers and sisters, right? And so James is writing to family members and he loves them, and he's giving them advice, and what we're going to find out is he's going to give them some tough love, right? He's going to give them some tough love in very hard times. Now, the occasion here is he's going to give direction and encouragement in the face of persecution, and most people think, and I think rightly, that this book is the earliest book in the New Testament, probably written in the late 40s AD, right? This is within two decades of the time that Jesus uh, ascended into heaven, right? So this is the earliest writing in the New Testament. And we think that because they still refer to the gathering of these early Christians. They're Jewish and they're Christian, but they refer to them as a synagogue. They, their gatherings are a synagogue. This is very early when the early Christians were still, right? They were worshiping Jesus, but they were attending synagogue. And they didn't see that they had, they needed to leave the synagogue because they had uh, they saw themselves as believing on the Messiah that the Old Testament pointed to. So they saw themselves as rightly where they should be. But later on, as the New Testament era goes on, the Jews who reject Jesus say, you don't belong in our synagogues. And they begin to kick them out of the synagogues, and Christians move then into what we know as the church, the assembly, the ecclesia, where they gather together and in establish this institution. Well, this is the church in terms of the people who believe in Jesus, but now they're still meeting in the synagogue because they don't see that they've left their Jewish identity in any sense. They see that they've fulfilled it in terms of that, but they're undergoing persecution. And the persecution most likely is the one that if you turn to Acts chapter 8, and I want you to turn there with me for a moment, Look at Acts chapter 8 at verse 1, right? And this is a familiar event. Uh, this is Saul makes his first appearance in the pages of the New Testament. And Saul makes his first appearance, the guy that we'll later know by his Roman name, Paul, makes his first appearance as a persecutor of the church and somebody who's trying to kill Christians. And he succeeds, right? So... On that day, verse 1, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered. Throughout Judea and Samaria, godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Right? So this is the backdrop of the book of James. Right? Now, I've mentioned this to you before, right? uh, people in the 1040 window, as it's referred to today, or the, the uh, third world, or as actually population-wise, the two-thirds world, right? two-thirds of the world, uh, people often look at us in the West and the way we read the book of James, they laugh at us uh, because of the way we read the book of James. Uh, and so here in the West, so I'm looking at Josh Hensley over here, so he just caught my eye and he's saying, oh, that's bad. So Josh just caught my eye over here, and Josh, he got up this morning. This is a, a, not a true statement, right? So I'm making up something. Josh got up this morning, he, he had his iPhone, and he was in there shaving, uh, and he had the, the water running, and uh, he was sitting there listening to a podcast while he's shaving in there, uh, and all of a sudden, he bumped his phone, and it fell over in the toilet, Right? And there's his iPhone, you know, swimming like five inches deep in there. And he goes, ah, oh, you know, and scream, goes and reaches that. And then he remembers James chapter 1, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Okay, God, I've, you got me today. I can live today even if my iPhone doesn't work today. Man, God, this is a rough day today, right? And so we look at that and it's like, well, the joke like in missions is that's those first world problems, right? Like I can't get... You know, we got supply chain crisis and my best brand of cereal is not available anymore. Dad, go on it. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, right? That's the kind of thing here. 
Now, what I want you to, to point out to you here, that the people that James is writing to are refugees. They're refugees. They've lost their homes. They've lost their social network, right? And they've got people hounding them, trying to imprison them, even kill them, right? These are the people that he says, count it all joy when you fall into various difficulties. And you're going like, James, can you give them a little quarter, right? Can you give them a little break, right? Things are difficult. James very likely is writing from Jerusalem, and he's writing to people who are dispersed. They're running, they're out, the surrounding area around Jerusalem was Judea. And then beyond Judea, the next was where half Jews, Samaritans lived. So some of them have been pushed out in Judea, and some of them have been pushed out into Samaria, and they've got somebody hounding them, Saul being the ringleader, and they're, they're running for their lives. They've lost their jobs. They've lost their synagogue. They've been kicked out. They've lost their social network. They, these are desperate desperate people with desperate times. And this is where James writes, right? So this advice is not for those just difficult days. This is advice for the disaster days, right? The darkest days of life, right? This is what James is writing into. And what James is going to say, the only way you can get through these days is if you hold fast to God and his goodness. That's the only way you're going to make it. The only way you're going to make it is you've got to hold fast to that, right? He's going to talk to them about it. All right. Now, so to give you kind of a visual picture here, right, I've used this before. You've got believers, right, and God is there, and then all these things happen. I got, I got too fast with my little illustration here, okay? So they're homeless, they're persecuted, they're used, they're desperate. These are all the things that are happening. We're going to talk about, you know, refugees, and if you study refugee populations, one of the things that you find is happening all over the world today, right? And, and places in Africa, places in China, places in uh, 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 the Far East, these kinds of... When you have refugee populations, you've always got unscrupulous people who are looking to take advantage of them. It's happening on our southern border, right? Sex trafficking, all kinds of things. You've got desperate people who want to get in uh, away from desperate conditions in Guatemala and different places. And there they are, and they're ripe for exploitation. And people exploit them because who's their advocate? Who cares about them? Who's going to stand up for them, right? And matter of fact, they, they, because they're fleeing, they don't want to let people know things that are happening. Well, here you have uh, and what we're going to read in the book of James is these people have been, they've run out of their towns, they've come to little hamlets, and now they've got to provide for their families. Now they need a roof over their head. Now they need protection from people who are going after them. And so what they're doing is they're sucking up to local powerful people. And they're saying, give us jobs, right? Be our patron, protect us. And these powerful people are looking here and saying, well, here's a ripe group of people to exploit and then they come and work for these people, and then at the end of the day, they don't pay them anything. They don't pay them anything. And James is going to give a woe against them and say, God's judgment is coming on you because you're, you're, you're getting fat in the day of slaughter. Right? So they're being exploited in the midst of this. This is a desperate condition. And so when all these things are coming in, what's happening to this group of people that James is concerned about is as these pressures come in, God's dropping out of vision and instead of turning to him and him becoming a focus, well, then they're afraid and they're trying to figure out how to get out of this difficult situation using their own scruples. And they're not looking to God. They're not talking to him. James chapter 4, the reason you don't have is because you don't ask. And the reason you don't ask, or when you do ask, you just ask to tell me what you need. You need to come humble yourself before me. Right? They're fighting one another, right? When you get under pressure, right? and I know this has happened to you in your homes, right? If you get two people and they're under pressure, sometimes you can, e you can either turn toward each other or you can turn on each other. And especially if the threat is out there and you can't attack the threat directly, then you get frustrated and then you attack your husband, you attack your wife, you attack your kids, right? You attack whoever, right? And they get the crappiest you while the people out there get the person who's under control. So people are going to be battling one another. There's anger, there's fear, there's desperation. All those kind of things are going on in what's happening here. Right, so as you work through the book, and this outline is in your study guide, 
uh, this kind of idea, hold fast to God's goodness, allows Christians to face adversity in a way that promotes Christian maturity and God's glory, right? This is in your notes, so you don't need to copy this. Holding fast to God's goodness makes hearers doers. Holding fast to God's goodness leads to kingdom-centered gatherings. Ah, I, I saw Rick, and, uh, Rick Hillier and I yesterday were, were out hunting yesterday, and it was truly hunting since I was the only one that had an opportunity to get anything, and I missed it uh, yesterday, so we did no finding uh, to my frustration. But as we were driving home, um, we came across the car that was on the side of the road with uh, the, the engine running and that brake lights on, and we just stopped, and Rick said, we just need to go check on this. Both people were inside the car, and they were passed out. Both of them were overdosed on drugs. And we couldn't get in the car. The car was locked. You couldn't get in it. And we couldn't do anything to help them when, when, to do it. So we just called the, the sheriff and sat there and waited on it. And uh, we got there and uh, the people got there and they had to take a crowbar to bust the window out so that they could get the car door open. The first man that they got out of the door, which was the driver, they had to, they had to shoot him four times with Narcan. And the last time, well, I don't, I don't describe what they had to do the last time, but they had to do it in, in a very unique way that Rick or I had never seen before. They had to do it directly, and it was only that last fourth thing that actually revived him. And he was just, uh, the guy on the other side, they gave him Narcan twice or something along those lines to get him out of there. And, and the thing that, it was just so sad. It was so sad. Just so sad. And, I, and what came to my mind, I told Rick this last night, what came to my mind is that those people are as valuable as anybody in this room. You know, as Rick said, you know, is there, are these dads? Are they brothers? Right? Watching the, 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 the safety, watching the highway patrol, the sheriff, the, the, the people, the, the girls saying there, this is my fourth one, I think, in, in four days or fourth one in, in two days or whatever it was. She's just angry, mad that she had to deal with another person. The, other, well, the guy on the seat on the other side, they knew him by name because they'd done it many times. What does it look like for us to have kingdom-centered gatherings where what we love is the person that God has created in his image and we care about everyone? All right. Holding fast to God's goodness produces generosity for the least of these, right? We're going to look at that one. And then, uh, oops, I got too far. And then holding fast to God's goodness would mean that only those whose hearts are governed by godly wisdom would seek or be sought out for leadership. Holding fast to God's goodness would lead to humble appeals to God instead of competitive malicious conflict. We're going to talk about that. Holding fast to God's goodness brings the future judgment to bear on the present. And then holding fast to God's goodness looks to God as the center of everything. And so we're going to talk about all of those as we work our way through. Now, everyone can identify with the book of James like we've said before because everyone deals with disasters, right? Uh, and matter of fact, uh, your disaster today may turn out to be something in, as you grow older that you think, well, that was pretty mild, and I thought it was pretty big at that point in time, right? If you have teenagers in your home, their disasters may seem a lot larger than you think they are, right? But at the same time, hopefully as you grow older, it takes more to knock you off your feet or to really knock you back. Hopefully you grow beyond the toddler who has a meltdown when somebody takes their toy, Right? But as we grow older, our disasters may change, but everybody deals with them. And the simple thing is, when you have a broken person, me and you, and you've got a broken world with broken people, you've got hard and challenging times. You just do, right? And, and if you think, this is one of the things even about this COVID stuff, right? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm all for people taking every precaution that they think they personally need to take, apart from going into a hole and hiding out for the rest of their life, Right? When you need to take the precautions that you take, one of the things that, we, that, have been, that have been clear, especially about this Omicron variant, is that the thing that's been funny, well, funny or, or maybe interesting, is to see people who thought they were keeping all the rules, right? They were triple vax, they had kept themselves apart from everybody and so forth, and I, there's nothing wrong with any of that. And then they got Omicron, and they felt like, well, wait a minute, I was keeping all the rules, I shouldn't have gotten sick. And they realized that they had been guilting other people who had gotten sick because if they had done better in taking care of themselves, they wouldn't have got sick. And now all of a sudden, they're sick. And they're thinking, maybe I, hadn't, I shouldn't have been so judgmental, right? 
Now, all I'm saying is you need to take every precaution that you need to take that you think is wise, especially considering your own life, your own cor comorbidities you have, the people in your life. You need to think, think carefully, vary about that. But you're going to have hard times. I don't care how many times you wash your hands. I don't care how careful you are. Life is not under your control, and especially the people around you are not under your control, right? And so if, if you think that the Christian life is about doing all the right things, going to church, doing all, and you won't have hard times, you don't have a deep understanding of what it means to live in a broken world, right? And matter of fact, what James is going to say, in God's mercy, he takes the brokenness and he does deep good things in us through us to deeply grow us in relationship with him and make us powerful instruments to affect change in the broken world. That's what he's up to, right? And so this is important. We can't, we, uh, James is not going to give them five steps to keep getting sick, from keep getting sick, right? Six steps on how to never have any chaos in your life. He assumes you're going to have difficulties. What do you do when you get into them, right? Let me, let me say this about uh, marriages, Right? Some of the, the false ideas about marriage is if you have the right partner, right? you always agree on everything. Right? Well, if you have a partner that agrees with you on everything, it, either, it probably means that they're suppressed and dominated by you. Because right? if you're a man and she's a woman, then you're going to think differently about different things. Right? And you get different personalities. And if they never voice their opinion that disagrees with you, it probably means that, that they've given up because you shout it down every time or you never listen to it, or you just go right over it because you're going to have a different opinion than they do. And then some people come by, well, wait a minute, we had an argument, we had a disagreement, we, maybe we're not fit for each other. Well, no. How you have your disagreements is important. How you have them, right, you need to do it in a godly way. But if you want intimacy, if you really want to know one another, you need to tell each other what you disagree about, right? And so uh, there's something wrong with a church that never disagrees with each other over things, right? Because not everybody agrees about everything in here. And we need to have conversations that respect one another, that we can talk to each other about the things that we differ on, right? If we want to know each other. Because you guys know how to manage relationships when you really don't want to know somebody. So if I'm around Rebecca... And I can always talk about her, I can talk about her job, I can talk about different things, I can keep it, I can never probe her on what she thinks about anything because I don't want to get into that awkward moment that I may disagree with her. And then I have to, have to actually wade into that. Well, no, let's just keep it on the surface level so that I never really get to know her because then I might have to deal with something that I disagree with her on, right? Well, if you want to know another person, you're going to find things that you disagree on and you're going to have to talk about them, right? So that's just a part of what living here right? So here's just an example of all kinds of things that some of you may be facing, job loss, illness, bullies, breakups, COVID-19, right? I'll, I'll be glad to get rid of that word. Crazy co-workers, right? So I don't have any of those at, at, at church except for Steve Ruffner. Bad, bad economy, right? Unjust comparison, rejection, abuse, right? A broken family, right? Somebody's used you, right? Many people, we've known what it means to be used, to somebody get something through us, right? But they don't want us, they just want something that we happen to be a gateway to, right? All those kinds of things happen in a broken and fallen world, right? So James has a, has a diagnosis that he wants to get through, three steps, is they need to get God, right? The answer first is, is and, and again, we've seen this over and over again. If you go to the book of Ephesians, if you remember this, if you go to 1 Peter, you've got people who are facing difficulties. The people in Ephesians are af afraid of the dark side of the spiritual world. In 1 Peter, they're being persecuted by the government. Here we are in James, they're being persecuted by their fellow Jews, their family members. Every time, every time in those dark moments, they don't jump to the practical steps on what you need to do to face persecution, like how to hide, right? Uh, how to build a, you know, a special you know, uh, hiding space in your uh, house, right? Where to run for trouble. Every time what they do is they turn to praise. They look upward. They look to God and they say, you need to get firmly in your mind who God is and what he is doing, what he has done, what he will do for you. You need to look up, 
right? And James' first thing is says we need to get firmly clear in our mind that God is good and every good gift come down, right? That's the most important thing that we have to hold on to because that's going to determine where we run when we're in trouble. It's going to determine how we get through the trouble. It's going to determine how we respond to each other in the trouble, right? All that because if we believe God and He's good, then we're going to look to Him for advice and what He tells us to do, we're going to do even if it seems counterintuitive, right? So one of the things that God says, if you've got an enemy, here's a counterintuitive piece of advice. What are you supposed to do? Love your enemy. Uh, Oh, wait a minute, God. Are you sure that's what you said? Yes. Jesus went, love those who despitefully use you. That's his advice. That's how you're going to get through this difficulty. God, how do I do that? Right? Your, Your wife is not giving to you what you deserve. She's neglecting you, doesn't respect you. What's God's advice? Love your wife. But wait a minute, God. I'm going to give back to her what she's given to me. No, no, no. You're to give to her what I gave to you. Now, wait a minute, right? So we're going to look at that. So th- then you would be a single mind, and this is the, the antithesis of everything that James is getting after is a person who, who hedges their bets, a person who comes into a difficulty, and they say, well, here's what God says, here's what my mom says, here's what the culture says, here's what my favorite TikTok influencers say, and you know how important they are, right? And here's what so-and-so says, and here's what God says over here. Let me see. Oh, that seems too hard. I think I'm going to follow the TikTok influencer over here. Maybe I can get a million followers, right? So the double-minded person is the person who has the audacity to be the final court of appeal, Like, I just sit there and I look at the various options, and it's not that I trust that God is good and He's the only way. I just pick and choose the one that I think is best, right? So there's no faithfulness, no commitment to God, and so we're going to meet some of them, for example, in that famous passage of chapter 2, where James talks about, don't tell me about a faith that doesn't live itself out and obey God. Because you get people going, well, I have faith in God, I just don't show it. I just go incognito for Jesus, Right? That's just like every husband in here saying, you know, honey, when I go to work, you know, I take my ring off and I put it in a thing and a nice special drawer and a little special, you know, a container that I have for it that just I want to show you how special you are. But, you know, for me to be a married man at work, it's just too much hassle and it kind of hurts some relationships and stuff like that. So I'm just going to go incognito as a married man. And every, every wife has gone, no, you're not. And no, you're not. There's something deeply wrong in the way you're thinking, buddy, right? And every married woman who sees a guy who hides his married status or a woman around, if she has any sense about her, she knows he's a bad guy, right? And so a person who trusts in God, one of the things you want to do is you want to hold fast to him through the difficulty, point people to him because that's the only way you're making it through it. There's no other saviors anywhere. So devoted to him, and this will provide hope, direction, and stability that they need in their time of disaster, right? That's what we want is him. And so James wants single-minded, devoted people, right, is what he's looking for. Okay, so let's look at our exhor- exhortation. Let's come to James chapter 1 and to give us a background of where we are. And here's what he says, right, in that famous passage that we've all quoted, sometimes with tears, sometimes glibly almost mocking it, right, in the midst of the difficult moments, sometimes uh, hoping, God, please help me to find joy in this moment. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, okay? Now, one thing I want to say here, James is not saying that disasters are good things. He's not speaking about things that are evil that are good, right? Right? So things that have happened to you, somebody's abused you, somebody has has lied about you, somebody slandered you, somebody hit you, somebody is bullying you on social media, somebody is misrepresenting your character, right? Uh, A a guy or a girl in a relationship you had, they they dismissed you or let you go in a way that was just painful, all right? They ghosted you, right? They did all those kind of things. All those, none of those things are good. They're evil things, Right? What he's talking about is James is saying that there is a reason to respond to them with courageous hope, even anticipation, and not despair, right? 
There's a reason to respond to them with a, a, an anticipation that God is going to do something deep and good, even as I'm crying right now, right? And this is the other part of this. Joy does not mean that you have a smile on your face through the trial. That does not, joy is not associated with a particular posture of, you know, the, the smiling face, right? My wife just died. God's good, this is great. No, no. Joy is a, is, is a deep rooting in the confidence that you have in God so that you respond appropriately to the moment, but you have a response of grief that has hope with it, not despair. You respond with anger, but not rage to something that's evil. Joy is to have your life guided by and directed by God's goodness and his principles so that your response is appropriate to let God do his work in you and do his work through you. Because joy responds with anger to evil, rightly, but not rage that moves people to destructive behavior. Joy responds with tears to real sadness because we weep with those who weep and we rejoice with those who rejoice. We respond with real tears, but we don't respond with despair. We don't become Job's wife, just curse God and die, right? We respond with hope, with direction, right? But we don't stand outside the suffering. We're not Christians who walk into people weeping and we speak as if, hey, if you really believed in God, you wouldn't be crying right now. And I want to say, if you really believed in God and understood that, you just shut up and go sit down. That's not how love behaves. Love does not behave that way. Right? So the issue here is he's not saying that the things themselves are good, but he's saying that God is going to so work in a deep and powerful way that what seems to be a disaster, he's going to make into something beautiful in you and through you for the benefit of other people if he's going to say you let it have its perfect work. Right? Now, second thing, the basis for the exhortation, look at verse 3. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. God is conditioning you to endure with a look toward and a trust in Him, right? Now, when you think about endurance here, endurance isn't just holding on, right? It's just not gritting your teeth, right, and holding on. Endurance here is, is holding on to God through it, right? You're holding on to God through it. You're looking to Him for wisdom. You want to get, this is what we're going to see in chapter 5. Chapter 5, when it talks about that famous passage where it calls the elders to come around if a person's sick, well, then bring the elders around to have a pray for that person, right, and deal with sin if it's there, pray for their sickness, all those kind of things. The simple advice there, I think, that James is giving, underlying that whole passage, if you come to one of the darkest moments of your life, which may be your deathbed, one of the darkest moments of your life, well, if you're a follower of God and you love him, who do you want around you in that moment? You want the people who know God deeply. You want the people who talk to God. You want people who can give you God's wisdom on how to navigate this moment. When you're in pain, when you're facing one of the darkest moments, well, what do you want? You want somebody who's a spokesman for God to come around and help you navigate that dark moment. You don't want to turn to the idiots who are crying over in the corner or the people who are telling you to curse God and die or the people that are, that are running and trying to find every way to get out from under it. You want a deep knowledge of God so you can trust him in that moment and do let it happen what God wants to happen in you and through you, right? And so the issue here is he's conditioning us to be people because we're going to live in a fallen, broken world until Christ returns. He's even going to tell them in chapter 5, be patient because we're waiting for the Lord to return. But as we do, we're going to go through difficulty. And he's going to point us to Job as an example, right? So the idea here is he he's conditioning you to build some spiritual fortitude in you. He wants to take you as a believer into dark places with the light. And the only way you're going to be able to go into dark places with the light is if you have such an attachment to the light that you can overwhelm the darkness, and not be overwhelmed by it. If you're working in a secular environment, he wants you to so own your relationship with God that I don't care how dark your colleagues are, how they speak, how they behave, what they induce you to do, you hold on to Jesus, you represent him, even if it means you just don't participate. 
Even if it means you have to step up and say, you know, hey, I don't think that's appropriate. You hold on to him, right? So that you're unflinchingly, and, and that that is a powerful witness to the reality of Jesus, okay? So, and this is the truth, and this is part of our, our memory verse. Do not be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures, right? God has brought us to himself. He's, new, he's made us a new creation, and he's busy growing us into our new identity. Everything you need for that journey comes down from him. Your roommate can't keep you from getting it. Your wife can't keep you from getting it. Your colleague at work can't keep you from getting it. Your competitor at school can't keep you from getting it. Every good thing that you need to deal with life and its difficulties comes down. Down. Not through. Down. Right? Now, so the expl explanation then in verse 4, he says this, uh, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. It will only lead to endurance, to patience, and eventually to wholeness. And I think he's talking about maturity, right? When you let the disaster work as God intends, okay? Now, the idea here is maturity, and, and this is why I think about joy, maturity is, is weighting things appropriately. A person who's mature recognizes what really is important and what isn't important. And when something important is attacked, they get all engaged because something really that matters is at stake. When something unimportant is under threat, you don't see them freaking out because they recognize what really is weighty and what isn't, right? I'll give you a simple example. As a, as a parent, right, all of us as parents, we want our kids to be functioning citizens. We want them to be kind people. We want them to go on, and we don't want them, if we're a healthy parent, we don't want them sitting at our table when they're 35, right, and, and being treated by mom like they were 16, right? We want them to mature and to grow into adulthood. We want them to step out and take on responsibility. We want them to do that, right? But even though those are all important, way weightier than all of that is where are they in regards to their relationship with Jesus? That is my first prayer, right? Right? God, I want them to know you, to walk with you. All the other stuff, that's going to work out of that. But if they have everything, if they're the most successful person, the most powerful person, if they create a kind of identity that goes back on me and makes me look good as a parent, well, that's a, okay, great. The issue is, do they know Jesus? Do they know Jesus? And if they don't know Jesus, then Jesus says they can gain the whole world and you lose your soul, then you've lost everything. Right? So a mature person strips away the stuff that don't matter and you get to the things that matter. And so in your life, your relationship with God is the core issue about you. Every day, it's the core issue. Right? More than your performance at work, more than your reputation, more than it's your relationship with God is the core issue. And that you need to tend to. And if you're mature, it begins to strip away and say, at the end of life, you know, when I've been at the end of life a lot this fall, what's the only one who's going to take you through that dark valley? Your successes in life, your family, your money, your material, no, nothing. The only one that's going to walk you through that valley to life on the other side is Jesus. The only one, right? And so when the key things, and so... Many of you know this from the voyage of the Don Treader, right? Eustace, right? This famous little story. Eustace becomes a dragon, right? He just becomes an evil little boy. Uh, he gives in to his sin, and he becomes a dragon. And he meets up with Aslan, and he wants to be changed. He wants to be brought back to his identity as a boy. And he sees Aslan. He yearns for it. He tries to pull the scales off on his own. He's able to pull a couple scales off, but there's still the dragon skin is still on top of him. And he wants to get it off. 
So he tries and he tries all of his own efforts to try to get it off, pulls some scales off, the little pile of scales are there, but that old scaly dragon skin just reproduces itself. He's still got the pains in his arms and his legs that come from the, 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 the weight of the skin that's on him. And Aslan says, well, I can, I can clean you if you let me. And so he lets him, he lets him clean him in the story as he comes over and he, he sees this bath of water and Eustace thinks, well, I'm just going to go get in the water. Think of Naaman, the leper. I'm just going to go get in the water. I'm just going to get this clean water. I'm going to get in there. And Jesus says, no, no, no. i got to take your clothes off first before you get in the water. And so he lays back and thinks he's going to take the, the outside off. And then he takes his claws, Aslan, and he sticks it into the skin and rips right down to the under real him. And it's painful. And it's deep. And only Aslan can pull it off. And, and he's going through it and he thinks, this is killing me. And when he's done, he comes out clean and new. And it just points to us, the kind of transformation that God wants to work in you and me is so deep. It's so profound. We still think that we're pretty good. We think that if we just had a couple tweaks, right, if you know, I could just be a little bit more consistent here or there, or if my wife would treat me a little bit better, or I just had a better boss, or I just had a little bit more money, or I had these kind of things that, that we would be okay, and, and I know there's a couple things, God, that I need to improve, and I just talked to you about those in my New Year's resolutions, right? A couple things. And we're up here messing around the top, and God's saying, there's something so deep and profound I want to do in you. You're not prepared. You won't do it on your own. I'm going to do it for you because I love you too much to leave you living on the surface of life. And God has some difficulties for us, right? Out of love to grow us to the people that he wants us to be. We're more deeply selfish than we think we are. We're more deeply idolatrous than we think we are. We're no more deeply distorted sexually than we think we are. We're more deeply... Uh, tied to the stuff of life and to food than we think we are. We're more, we're more deeply concerned about our own glory than we are about God's glory. And we think, right, and maybe it's just God's mercy that he doesn't put a full court press on us at any one time, right? Like just God comes up, like my eighth grade shop class, the guy would have this clear cellophane thing and he would lay it down over my drafting drawings, Right? I always, always just, I didn't look forward to it because I knew he was going to find this line was too long, this angle was off, this one was off. He would just put it down over it and it would go, and he, and he would say, he didn't, he didn't say that, but in my mind I was saying, oh, it's crap. I just screwed up the whole thing, right? And I think if God, if he took the, the vision of who he's going to recreate us to be and he put it down over the person that I am today, there would be such a disconnect between the two. God is going to do something deep in us to create something beautiful and we're trusting him because he's good. All right? Now, the means then, how is God going to do it? He's going to do it if we, he's going to provide us wisdom, right? And here, I think in your notes you have this in terms of, of wisdom, is we ask God for wisdom. Well, what is wisdom here? I don't think that wisdom for James is necessarily just you ask God for a particular word, should I go through the right door or the left door? You know, God says, Right door. And you go, okay, right, you go through the right door. No? Uh, should I speak up at this meeting, God, or should I be quiet? And God, you know, uh, all of a sudden on the whiteboard, and nobody else can see it in the room, but you can see it right up in the corner, it says, speak up, Greg, right? No, I'm not talking about any of those kinds of things. Now, can God do unusual things at times? Yes. He can do those things. But what you find throughout the book of James is what he does, he brings the wisdom of what God's already revealed about himself to bear on the problems, right? So it assumes that you're, you've got a working knowledge of God's truth, that you understand who God is and how he operates. And as you go through difficulties, you bring that truth to bear on your circumstance. And so wisdom is a God-given insight into the nature and ways of God that properly orients us toward the difficulty and enables us to respond in a God-glorifying, life-giving way, right? So we get, a, we get a perspective on One of the simplest things is to know is no matter how difficult the thing is, is this doesn't mean that God isn't good. No, God is still good even if this is a dark day. And because he's good and because he's all-powerful, 
I can trust him that this is not out of control, that this is not meaningless, that God has somehow fallen asleep up in heaven and gone, oh, oh, Greg, sorry, things got out of control, and then he's got to work real hard to fix it, right? So God's goodness uh, is in bringing insights to bear on our struggles. Now, so the positive direction, though, you must ask out of belief, okay? And this is the thing here he's going to say, you must ask out of belief and not doubt. And we're going to talk about what the difference between those, right? Well, belief is a posture of humble trust in God's presence and goodness, okay? And we're going to, I think, and many people do as well, that when you come into the darkest moments, usually there's two things that you come to doubt about God. Is he good? And is he there? God, can you really be good and this happen to me? God, how can you be good given the family I have? God, how can you be good given this illness that I'm struggling with? God, how can you be good given the way my husband is treating me? God, how can you be good in these moments? God, are you there? Do you hear me? So here, belief is saying, God, I believe you're good. I believe you're there. God, please, right? And the reason that I can trust God is good and that he's there is because he's got a good track record of being good and being there, right? And I've learned from the people of God throughout the the scriptures, at times when people felt like God wasn't there, he was fully there. At times when it felt like that it was an absolute victory for evil, to use a C.S. Lewis kind of idea, there was a deeper magic at work that God was going to take that crucifixion and redeem the world through it. That looked like everything had failed, but actually, God had triumphed, right? So, a belief is here as I'm holding on to that. And so, uh, as Os Guinness says in his book, Dark, right, we do not know, whoops, I'm sorry here, I got, I'm, I'm losing my position altogether, bad clicking, all right? We do not know why, but we do know why we trust in the God who knows why, right? If I ever doubt God loves me, I need to go sit at the foot of the cross. If I ever have too much of a high estimation of myself, like I deserve better, I need to go sit at the foot of the cross. And if I doubt God's ability to deliver, I need to go set at the empty tomb. I need to go set at the empty tomb and say, what kind of man walks out of the tomb? Those are the truths that I have to hold on to in the darkest moments of life. When you're in Death's Valley, when somebody that you love is in Death's Valley, when you're struggling with a chronic illness, when you're dealing with a child or a loved one who has some sort of disability that is going to shape your life. You have to go back and sit at the cross often. You have to go to the empty tomb and sit. That's the Christ who loves you. That's the Christ who's delivered you. All the deepest, darkest things that truly threaten you have been removed. Everything that you yearn for will be provided. And everything that you need today to get through where you're gone is yours in Christ. Trust Him. And this is where we may be in situations when you're in your darkest moments and we've been there with the people that we love. This is where the body of Christ comes in, where we become the visual demonstrations of God's presence and goodness, right? Like the friend, uh, the, the friend uh, friends of the man who wanted desperately to see Jesus, <laughs> And he couldn't walk. So what they do? They picked him up. And they carried him, the four guys. They carried him. And and it was so crowded, they 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 couldn't get him to Jesus, but they desperately, they loved Jesus, trusted Jesus. They so wanted him to get to Jesus. What they do? They cut a hole in the roof. Remember that? And they lowered him down through the roof so they get to Jesus because they so loved Jesus, so trusted Jesus. And it says in in the gospel account, when he saw their faith, 
That sometimes we need to be eat, the, it, carrying other people on our faith. When you're in your darkest moment and it's hard for you to hold on to God's goodness and his presence, people around you need to hold on to that. And one of the ways you do that is you just enter in with a person and you cry with them. And you're there. And you don't try to get away from the awkwardness, the difficulty, the, the struggle to be inside of somebody else's suffering. Because we need to represent the goodness and presence of God. That's what he calls us to do. Right? So, faith does this. And I'm going to end here today, Grace, and I'm going to call you up afterwards. And I'll just come back and complete and then move on next time. But what does faith do then? Just to illustrate this with you here. Right? Here's what's going on with these people. Right? They're disillusioned. Right? Now, if you haven't had a moment that has disillusioned you about Christ and the gospel, you probably haven't really met anything really difficult or you just haven't looked around the world lately. God, are you there? Are you doing something? Right? And one of the things that we lose sight of as we get absorbed right in our own moment is literally with a minority of believers around the world, like the average Christian is a Nigerian woman. Billions of Christians around the world in places where the gospel, to use the expression from Colossians, is running. People are coming to Christ in many, many different places. People are being faithful in very dark places, right? And you look around, you see the things that are going on. People get disillusioned. These people have lost their homes, their synagogues. They thought that they were following Messiah, and now the fellow Jews that they thought were going to join them are rejecting them, right? Stephen, as we mentioned this before, Stephen, when he was killed, it was very likely he was killed by people who he had formerly gone to synagogue with, right? It wasn't strangers, and it was up close and personal. He was stoned. They were abused, crushed dreams, deserted, right? And all these things come crushing in, right, to a person's life. But what faith does is that God gets bigger, Right? God gets bigger because we return to him and there's a peace that a person has that is inexplicable. Because if you're putting yourself as any human being in the situation where that person is, you'd say that if there's ever a freak out moment, here is an opportune moment right here. I'd be freaking out right now. Right? And I'll tell you, if you're in the medical field and you see somebody who's in a desperate condition and they deal with the medical personnel with kindness and gentleness, right? Because I've been there in different situations where somebody's under threat and, and everybody around them is worried and they're screaming at the doctors and screaming at the nurses and screaming because why their fear is going, you got to help them. And they understand it. The doctors and nurses understand it, right? So the issue here is there's a peace that's, that's uh, uh, inexplicable. There's a gentleness about the person and I want to say here, there's a faithfulness, right? I don't understand, God, why you're letting this happen. God, I can't get this, but I'm just going to keep coming. The Psalms teach us that the way to deal with the darkest moments is just to keep going back into the presence of God and talking to Him about Him. Honestly, God, where were you? That's the psalmist. God, you, I feel like you've abandoned me. That's the psalmist. God, I feel like my enemies have triumphed over me. That's the psalmist. God, maybe I've cleansed my hands for nothing. Maybe you're not good, God. Maybe you're not there. God, I've given my life to you. I went to the temple. Read Psalm 73. God, I led people in worship. God, I did all the right things. And God, look at these people. They're, they're rejecting you. They're arrogant. And they seem fat and sassy and powerful. And they're ruling. And where am I? I'm just the off-scouring. I'm, 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 I'm beaten down. I'm Maybe I've just cleansed my hands for nothing. Right? But Asaph is holding on to God while he wrestles with his pain. He wrestles with it. He wrestles with it in the presence of God, right? And so faith holds fast. Even if you need to say, Greg, could you come over? I feel like I'm letting go. Friend, could you come over? I don't know how much more I could take. Please, can you come? 
right? Hold fast says, I need everything that God supplies, and his people are a part of his supply, right? Grace, will you come and lead us in a song, and then I'll come back and conclude us. I was just thinking while I was standing there, is there, can you just tell us as a congregation, is there those of us today that you would just say, Greg, I just need people to pray for me today. Things are just hard and difficult, all right? Just pray for us today. And if you can't tell us here, can you tell someone? Let them bear it with you. You need someone to come and help you to hold on when you feel like you're letting go. You know, Mike, can you put that last slide up there? Uh, This is a, a, a verse from Isaiah. Isaiah's writing to a group of people that are in exile, right? They have broken the covenant. Uh, They're under God's punishment, and they're going to be there for a while. And uh, they're tempted to cut and run from God. And Isaiah wants to encourage them. The whole last half of the book is to encourage them that God's faithful to his promises. He's going to be faithful even though you've been unfaithful. And And he encourages them, but he warns them. He says, which of you fears the Lord and obeys his commands? The man who walks in dark places with no light, yet trusts in the name of the Lord and leans on his God. And then he warns them and he says, but you who kindle a fire, and the background is this is, right, the the authorized fire is the fire at the temple that is a reminder of God's ongoing presence to bless and to sustain his people. An unauthorized fire is some other fire at some other temple. And he got saying, I have everything that you need. You stay faithful to me. You stay faithful to me through these dark places and I will deliver you. But if you're going to go walk by the light of another fire, what you're going to wind up doing is walking into that fire. I say this to you as a, as a follower of Jesus who struggles with my own sin. There's none the sting of, of giving in to a false savior that fire will consume you. Consume your relationships, consume your future, consume your hope, consume all those things. Let's covenant together as God's people to help each other hold on to Jesus. Pray with me, will you? Dear Heavenly Father, today we're so grateful for your kindness as to us. Lord, when we look back on your life, Lord, if if you would have come only if it was easy, Lord, none of what you had done would be done. Lord, you came and humbled yourself to be a baby, to be treated as a child. Lord, to come to those that you had created and longed to be in a relationship with and only to be spurned by them and rejected and ultimately crucified by them. Lord, yet in the midst of their evil, in the midst of their hatred, Lord, you were loving them all the way And you were providing for them what they didn't know that they needed, Lord, to deliver them from the fire they had walked in the two that was consuming them. Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to trust you, that you're a God who loves us cross deep. Lord, we were worse off than we could ever imagine, but we're loved more than we could ever believe. And you're a God who's more than able, Lord, to help us go through the difficulties that we face. So Lord, may we be people over this time that hold fast to you, Lord. You're the only secure ground in these days. Lord, guide us. Let your light take us toward one another, toward you. And Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Have a good day.